Hello, Jenny. I'm Danielle with Writing Workshops. I am the new chief literary enthusiast. And um, Blake invited me to speak to some of the upcoming instructors about their work, about their teachings, about their experience as writers. And when he offered up the opportunity, he asked me who I'd like to talk to. And you were my first choice. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Well, I just love all that you write about. I love your perspective on reading and editing and, um, you know, highlighting voices of people from South Asia, which is, you know, a, a community that I don't really see very many books from. So I'm excited right. to hear more about that. And I guess my first question for you is, I know that you um, do both translation and your writer, but what came first? Uh, well, the writing came first, for sure. Um, so I had been writing uh, from a very young age uh, and, uh, you know, school magazines and things like that, short story competitions as kids. Um, so the writing came first. Uh, but I would, because I spoke other languages, I did do translation work um, just you know, it was just part of what we did at home. If you read something in, in uh, you know, the language that we spoke at home and you felt you couldn't understand it, you would ask somebody to translate it or then you would try to translate it. So the translation was happening on an ad hoc basis. And then in 2017, I mentioned, uh, was it 2017? Yeah, 2017. I mentioned that I was translating a couple of stories just for my family uh, of my mom's favorite writer and the person I was talking with happened to be a literary agent and he jumped on it and he was like oh you know send it to me and let's see what we can do and get it published and and that's how that whole journey began wow that's amazing mm -hmm. so now do you have a preference I mean how do you find translating supports your writing I think I think it, it really does support the writing and uh, I, I can't choose one or the other. I like to do both. I like to ideally have one translation project and one writing project running uh, alongside. But I think the way that the translation helps the writing is that to be a good translator, you have to read very closely, right? You're reading every sentence, every word, every phrase very closely. So that skill of being a close reader, um, I think because you're, you're trying to choose the right word from language A to language B. And so that also helps you when you're writing and you're trying to think of the right words to communicate what it is you want to say. So I think that, that definitely helps. And then I think just my own writing as a short story writer or as a fiction writer, then when I go to translate fiction, that also helps me because I'm, you know, already immersed in the world of fiction. I know the techniques and the craft of fiction. So when I'm translating, does it's tra because translation isn't just about, you know, sort of translating words from one language to another. You, you are also interpreting what is it the writer is trying to say here? What are they trying to accomplish here? And so being a reader and a writer of fiction helps me with translating fiction. So it's a very mutual relationship. Oh, yeah. wow. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And not only do you do uh, the translation and the writing, but you also kind of offer a bit of like a mentorship or at least um, a platform for other writers. Can right. You talk a little bit about Desi Books podcast and how you got into that. Right. So um, Desi is, is, a, is an Indian word for sort of people of Indian origin or South Asian, because India used to be, the, you know, the South Asian subcontinent. And um, about a year ago, just over a year ago, I had just tweeted out and said, you know, it's so hard to find out what's going on with South Asian writers and what books are out there, because we don't get to read about them in the usual places, right, in New York Times and Literary Hub. And, you know, there's, there is some, but there's not as much. And so we have to go digging if we want to find those books. And so I just tweeted and said, you know, would anyone be interested if we had one place where you could go to for that kind of information and where authors would have a platform to come and talk about their books? And that tweet got a lot of responses and everything. And so I was like, okay, well, that's great. I, I should do this. 
And then last year, kind of things got a little away from me because my own books, you know, were coming out and I had to work on them. And then I, uh, you know, this year when the whole pandemic started and things got even tougher for writers, right? I mean, you know, you're not doing anybody who's launching a book this year and I'm one of those writers, you know, you're not able to promote your book the way you would have right? You're not out there doing book tours and readings and all of that because of social distancing. And so I thought, if there is a time where writers of South Asian origin need a platform, this would be a good time, right? Because it's something that we can do sitting at home. I can invite writers like you, you and I are doing right now. I can invite them and we can talk and, you know, I can try and promote, help them promote their book. And so that's kind of how that whole podcast began. And then um, it's, uh, it just kind of snowballed because suddenly people in the news wanted to cover, you know, like you've asked me, they wanted to know what's it all about and who, who, which are the writers you're bringing on and what are they saying? And so suddenly it became this thing that's bigger than I expected, which is great. And I've just... Um, I'm just grateful, you know, uh, Danielle, for meeting, for the opportunity to meet and discover writers that I never would have done before the podcast, you know. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just got back from South India. Uh, oh! I had that wonderful opportunity to go and attend uh, a wedding in Bangalore. Oh, it was Amazing. so beautiful. It's probably like one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. It was like mm. absolute. So, um, so I'm really curious about the stories that come out of mm. South Asia, South India, and uh, right. has anything come out of these podcasts that surprised you? Um, yes, yes. In some in some cases, yes. In some cases, it confirms what I already knew. So, in some cases, there are books that. I would never have even known of if I hadn't had this podcast and they would not, they hadn't approached me and said, Hey, I have a book coming out. And, you know, so I think there's been books that I would have totally not known about. So that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is uh, just in talking when I interview uh, writers of South Asian origin about how they came up with a certain story or a book that they've written. And the origins, when they tell me, it's always fascinating. For the most part, they've all had, I will say that, I mean, 90, more than 95% of them will tell, have told me this. They've all had a hard time getting their books published. Mm -hmm. And the biggest reason, the most common reason, I would say, has been what, that unless they are writing about a certain image of South Asia, that publishers would like to see unless they are writing about those things that it's hard to sell and what i mean by that is unless they're writing about let's say i don't know slum life right. arranged marriage mm -hmm. uh terrorism mm -hmm. crooked politicians and those are the things people expect right Every, everybody's seen slum dog millionaire and so they yeah and so you know and everybody's you know that that new indian matchmaking show on netflix you know everybody's seeing that and so people who are not from south asia and are not familiar with it or haven't visited it like you have have a certain impression in their minds and they want the books they read to confirm those biases and impressions and so i will say the biggest I, the biggest surprise for me was how common that concern or, you know, problem seemed to be across the South Asian community of writers. Before that, I thought I was one of the few who had had that issue with my own book, trying to get my book published. But now I see that there's a lot of us who have faced the same issue. And so hopefully with, with the podcast, you know, with highlighting that I'm hoping that publishers and gatekeepers will see that and say, well, you know, as, as Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie said, the danger of the single story, you know? And so it's like, okay, that South Asia is a lot of different stories and a lot of different ways of telling stories. There are ancient storytelling traditions there 
there isn't just one story and there isn't just one way of telling it. So hopefully. Wow, what important work. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing the wide breadth of stories that yeah. of South Asia, because like you said, there's tons of people, tons of different walks of life. And, you know, I always hate when, you know, any community gets just kind of painted over as like a monolith where they yeah. all act alike and behave alike and have a certain way of being and it just right. you know kind of reduces that that group so it's it's amazing what you're doing and I'm curious too you know it does sound like the biggest hurdle for South Asian writers is getting published mm. um, have you considered maybe how your you know notoriety now and your exposure leveraging that to support them Right. So, I mean, right now, I think, right now, the way I see it, I'm supporting them by, you know, just bringing their stories and bringing their books. But, but I do hope that down the road, I can do more. I think, but I want to do, I don't want to do something half-baked. So if I do something bigger or something more, I want to make sure I get the funding to be able to do it. And I've applied to a couple of places. So you know, fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. And then if I can get the right amount of funding, then I hope to do, uh, hope to do more and see what, where we can go. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I just, I like kudos to you because I feel like that's such a big, you know, task to take on and for you to take, you know, carry that torch and to really make space for all of these up and coming writers who have beautiful and amazing stories. And, and in the midst of that, you have your own book coming out. Well, yeah. <laughs> And that's why I'm kind of, you know, I'm not doing a lot right now. But once that, once um, my book is behind me, then I can turn to doing something more. But yes, my book comes out next month. So. Yes, I know. It comes out a day before my birthday. Oh, does it? Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Uh, that's amazing. And you, you touched on, you know, this being a very unusual time for writers to be publishing books. Mm hmm do you have any new novel ways that you're planning on getting the word out about your book? I know you're very vocal on social media and you have a really beautiful presence and a lot of support, but what does it mean for you? Sure. Um, so yeah, you're right that um, the traditional ways, which was basically, you know, uh, going and doing readings and events and you're basically hand selling your book that, that those places, we're not doing that. Um, I'm certainly doing a lot of other things, which I think a lot of writers are doing, which is I have a bunch of essays coming out next month at places which hopefully will give visibility. So I'm writing about topics that are pertaining to my book. So, you know, I'm hoping that if someone reads one of those essays and they like it, then they'll go pick up the book. So that's one way that I think we all can do something. Um, that said, it is tougher to even get essays placed right now because a lot of freelance budgets have shrunk right so you know it's tough but you know you keep trying and then I think the other thing um, I do have two or three virtual events uh, well not two or three four maybe four or five uh, but what I've done with those virtual events I wanted to do something different um, so rather than just me and another person doing a zoom session where it's just a Q&A because I think that um, you know, it's good for what you and I are talking because we're talking about much deeper things, but with book related, just talking about just one person's book, I think there are so many of those events happening right now that people don't know where to go, which ones to attend. And, you know, there's this thing that people are saying they're getting Zoom fatigue, oh, right? Yeah. You know, right? You've heard that. So I thought instead of that, I thought I'd rather use the opportunity to do panel sessions where I'm inviting four or five other writers and we're talking not just about my book, but we're talking about how all of our books might be connected or what we're all trying to accomplish. So, and I think for some reason, booksellers are liking that approach. So Politics and Prose loved one that, uh, that I, you know, we pitched to them with six authors, my, with me and six, you know, five other authors. And so I think that's one way to change things up a little bit instead of just doing a virtual session, I'm doing like a panel session. So I'm hoping that will work. And then I think but besides that, it's just, as I said, the essays and social media, and then the podcast is trying to get the word out about other people's books, you know, and yeah, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't think I can 
I haven't thought of anything other than that that I could do innovatively. Well, I think it's a, it's a panel discussion. And I love that you are willing to work in unison so much because I do think that a lot of people overlook that and overlook the power of, of being in groups and being in community around a similar topic. Or Right. Well, but I think it makes more interesting discussion, right? When you have more viewpoints, it gives the audience something to, to log in and, you know, pay more attention to, right? So, yeah. That's true. And I, I think it turns it into more of a launch party. Yeah, yeah, it's like a yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, right. Well, you know, and I, I'm curious too. So, the title of your book, "Each of Us Killers," mm -hmm. how did you come up with that title? Well, so it's actually the last line of the title story, and it was not originally the title of the book. My the, the original title of the book was actually something that my editor thought was pretty boring. They thought it sounded like the title of a nonfiction book. Um, and so they suggested, they said, you know, this story is the most powerful one in your collection. And that last line is, you know, just, and so they, it was basically my editor chose that title. And I'm very thankful because it does, I think it does jump out at people, right? It, you remember it because, yeah. It, yeah. It's yeah. Got the word killers in there. Yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of like, where is this book going to go? Each of yeah. the well, no, so, it, you know, if somebody asked me that, somebody said, is it a thriller? Is it a murder mystery? And it's not any of those things. It is literary fiction. But yes, there is, there is death in there. That's why the word killers. But yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's not a mystery or, or a thriller. Interesting. I'm curious to read it because I'm like, I'm afraid I'm going to leave out of the book, you know, having a closer relationship to my inner killer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think that's partly what I have. Um, one of the reasons that line exists is because, in a way, I think the, the, the whole collection is centered around work, right? So it's about our working lives. And it's not something we get a lot about in fiction. We get a lot of fiction about love and sex, but, you know, our passion and our hunger for work is just as much. And, you know, William Faulkner said, we can't eat for eight hours a day. We can't make love for eight hours a day, but we do go to work eight hours a day, every single day. Huh? And, and so there's a lot that happens in our lives as far as work goes. And yet we don't have a lot of literature or fiction that focuses on the working life. And so my, my whole collection focuses on that. And I think that there's a lot that goes on in the workplace. There's power dynamics, there's corruption, there's, uh, class issues there's race issues there's gender issues and there's just so much that happens and so the whole collection is based on all those themes and each of us killers i i feel like sometimes we kill our own finer instincts mm -hmm. and other people's finer instincts when we uh you know when we're biased or prejudiced against them simply because of the color of their skin or simply because of their gender you know how much money they make or whatever or their job title and so yeah yeah oh you know and it's it's such a timely book right now that so many people are out of work and we're trying to redefine how we work and exactly yes well so to your point that that is exactly what prompted those stories for me as well because I left my corporate job in 2012 and my hope my goal was I had some savings and I thought I'm going to Till the savings run out, I'm going to try to be a writer, a full-time writer. I'd been taking workshops and stuff before that, but I was doing it sort of like a side hustle. I wasn't really focused on it. And then I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. But to your point, what happens is when you've been working most of your adult life, and then that's, that's really your main identity, and suddenly that work isn't there, and you haven't quite become the writer yet because you don't have your book out or anything, and you're suddenly in this limbo world where you're trying to redefine who you are. Mm. And to, to your point, you know, I, I was, my, there was a lot of, I was thinking a lot about what work means to us and how work changes us and how it shapes us as individuals. And so all of that played into these stories. So. Wow. You know, I just love hearing the backdrop to that book and how you came up with it because I feel like that story is so universal. Yes. I remember leaving my last job, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I worked a lot in disaster response. And so I got mm -hmm. to travel around the world and I got to do a bunch of stuff. And um, 
But like you, I wrote a lot as a child and I would win little essay contests and stuff. And mm. I, as a child, I always wanted to be a writer. Like I knew by about the time I was in the fifth grade that nobody thought that was a real job, you know, and then I had right. And I, and I had that kind of reinforced and yeah. I remember writing in the evenings when I was at work and mm. by that point I probably wasn't a great writer but I even remember telling you know my boss at the time that I was thinking about taking a break because I had finished this mm. and I wanted to get it published and I thought it right. could be and I just remember her saying to me that you know you're going to leave your job for a dumb pipe dream you know wow. and remember how that felt for me oh my gosh and just that realization of like this isn't oh. real you know like oh. this is something that I do and something that I enjoy but there's no real commerce attached to it there's no right value to it and right. and feeling that uncertainty so it's what it's amazing to hear about someone who's on the other side of that mm your work and your story and just that have that encouragement mm. and also just like a different perspective on it all of like this is what it looks like <laughs> right. right right yeah it's I, I I hear you I feel that what you just described because I know a lot of people I left my career at a certain point when I was doing well and people thought is she nuts what is she doing you know and it, you know it seems like there's nothing crazier to do than to become a writer Right. It's like, it's, it's the most benign thing you can do. You're just going to sit at your desk and just write away. You're not doing anything horrible to anyone, but it's like people look at you like you've gone crazy. Like what? You know? Especially with our relationship with books right now in the world, you know, it's, I feel like there's been a resurgence of, of people falling in love with books and a resurgence of writing right now. Yeah, yeah. For a while, it seemed like it had kind of lulled or it was becoming so easy to publish books that anyone could put out a book. And yeah. it was it's um it's way it's way for guests yeah yeah but you are you know still leading the front lines with new writers and you even have this amazing advanced <laughs> workshop coming up um tell us a little bit about what students can expect to walk out of the class with great yeah so um first of all i'll mention the two texts that we're going to read as part of the workshop the first one is a novel by tony morrison and it's jazz. And the reason, um, I, I love all of Toni Morrison's books. I've read and reread quite a lot of them. Each book I feel is a masterclass in writing. And she just has so many layers and nuances in every book. And um, every time I reread one, I learn something new. So that's number one. But the reason I picked this particular novel of Toni Morrison's is because for an advanced uh, writer, I think I believe you, you should have already mastered the basic techniques. You know, you know your plot and character and setting and, you know, some of those things. But now we're taking things to the next level where we want to understand how do you structure a narrative in a way that it really connects to the themes of the novel. And I think jazz in, in, in the novel Jazz, what Toni Morrison has done. So she's writing about a time in American history, the, the era when jazz really came into its own, right? The music form. But she's also writing about black history. She's also structured her narrative so that it's a little bit like jazz improvisation. Mm -hmm. And so you get that kind of musicality, not just in her words and language, but you get in, in the way the narrative kind of moves. And I think that's just a fascinating thing for us all to study as we look at, you know, trying to improve, take our fiction to the next level. So that's, that's what I want to be able to do with the class is to say, you have probably already got kind of the, the basics under control. Now, you know, what plot is, you know, what character is, you know, setting, you know, climax, you know, you know, the, all of those things. But now let's figure out how do you bring it all together in a way that just makes it really worth reading. Mm. So that's one aspect. On the craft side, I wanted a book um, that is kind of just no nonsense craft. And it's um, Ursula K. Le Guin's Steering the Craft. And I like her very practical, very down to earth voice. It's a, it's a series of essays, but they're structured very well. So it's, it, it really fits this eight week window because we can do a couple chapters each week and 
she goes into very specifics again. Uh, I, I really feel it complements Toni Morrison's book because Ursula K. Le Guin also goes into the sound of your language, the, the structure of your narrative, the rise and fall of your narrative, you know, how to know when you've said enough and how to know when you need to say more. And those are the kinds of things, you know, the exposition versus dialogue. And so those are the things that, that, that are in that second book. So I think with those books as our anchor points, as we look at each participant's um, you know, writing that they're going to bring, the 25 pages or so that they will bring to the workshop and we will all read and give feedback, if we have got those two as our guides or our signposts you know, to look at, I think it's going to inform the kind of feedback that we will be able to exchange and make it more meaningful. And so that's what I'm hoping this workshop will do with the help of those two texts. That's amazing. You know, I struggle with fiction writing. I tend to mm. take more towards personal essays and memoirs. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's just because my imagination isn't very well developed or what is going on, but do you have any recommendations or? Well, I mean, I think personal essays and memoir are very, uh, they take a certain amount of courage and I think just as much imagination. So I, I mean, I wouldn't say you don't have an imagination. I mean, I would never say that somebody who writes personal essays and memoir has an imagination problem. Maybe confidence, but not imagination. So it, it, to your question, if your question is, you know, if somebody is more comfortable in that form, in, in the nonfiction form, how do they switch to the fiction form? I would say that if you've already been doing personal essays, and I've written some, I actually find it more, I'm more comfortable doing fiction than nonfiction because I feel like I can't put too much of myself on the page. But I feel that people who are more, I, I find it an easier switch if you're doing nonfiction to go to fiction. Um, and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> this year, there a writer, a South Asian writer, Indian American writer, Sejal Shah, had, has a book of essays out. And it's called, this is how we dance. And it's a bunch of essays that she's written over a 20 year period. Some of them she wrote as short stories because they were actually details from her own life and then she tweaked them a little to make them not fiction. But then she's gone, she's gone back and she's put them back as nonfiction. But she talks about in her interviews and things about how, how she wrote them as an essays first and then she took out some details and she moved things around a little to make it fiction. So I think it's actually, it, it, it is actually possible that if, if you're writing nonfiction to make it fiction, whereas if you're writing fiction to make that nonfiction isn't quite as easy, right? So I would say that if you're already very comfortable writing nonfiction, by all means, your first draft can be a personal essay. It can be a memoir, as long as, you are making sure that you have a narrative structure, right? I think because, you know, with fiction, you do want, you do want like an opening inciting incident. You want your, you know, rise and fall of action. You want the narrative character arc. There has to be some journey. But the, those same uh, techniques apply to nonfiction too. So if you're already doing it there, you can certainly bring it across. So yeah, I wouldn't say it's a lack of imagination. It's probably just a confidence or comfort level right yeah I know, I, you know i think of these wonderful people that can come up with these amazingly abstract stories mm. seemingly out of the blue mm. and create a whole world around them and you know, well the world building yes i think that takes time to your point that does and and i know i had to learn it you know over time but i always so i'm very much uh somebody who likes to do outlines I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the kind of writer who can just sit down and, oh, here we go, here's a story, you know, brainstorm a story. I need a structure, I need an outline. And so I would say that to your point about world building, if you read uh, interviews with, you know, folks who write, say, fantasy or science fiction, they are building like entirely different worlds. And I don't think, I think almost every interview I've read with people like, the, with writers like that, they all do outlines. They are all very good about, you know, laying out a whole world on paper before they write the story around it. So I think outlining to build worlds is definitely 
yeah, important. Yeah, and I, um, I once uh, heard Elizabeth Gilbert say that you actually can learn more about her through her fiction writing in her nonfiction memoirs, because she somehow ends up revealing more of herself than that. Yes, I, I can see that, especially with Elizabeth Gilbert, because you're right, she's written the nonfiction. But then I, I find my, I'm more comfortable writing fiction, personally, to your point, because I think I can put more truth in it. Mm. I, I feel I can put more truth in it about what I'm thinking, as opposed to, I feel more vulnerable when I write nonfiction. I, I feel more open and I'm not always comfortable with that. So interesting. So maybe we'll learn a lot about you through your fiction writing. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hmm. Okay, well we're at the end, but is there anything that you would like your readers and your future students to know before we end? Well, uh yeah, just I think for the students in particular, um, I would say that you know, when they look at me, I want them to know that it's never too late to start. Mm -hmm. uh, start any kind of new writing project or even just start a writing life. Um, so I don't think that it's ever too late to start. And I think that a lot of writing happens away from our desk or away from the page. So I've always said to younger people, younger writers, when they ask me, I've always said, go live life a little go get some life experiences because then you bring that to the page. I don't think I would be the writer that I am today if I hadn't had this whole other life before I came to the writing. So I would, I, that, that would be my one thing. And then as far as just, I think, um, I, I want to say try and read as diversely as possible mm -hmm. because so many of us, we have this bias and I'm not as widely read as I'd like to be either. There are cultures I've never read from, and I do try to. I'm trying to expand my own um, writing and reading. But I think that the more we read about other cultures, the more we will be understanding of the difficult things that are happening around us. And right now, you know, more than hashtags on social media, what we need is just really to understand each other and get along with each other more, especially in these times. So I would say read more widely as much as you can. Mm 